it. Now I'm filming this video at half past midnight on Monday the 1st of November 2021. In the last few hours I've just done a live online stream fitness class for people uh, for the last um, hour and a half I've read an article uh, in the mainstream media about how a student called a married folk killed herself after learning that she had failed her recent examinations. It gives me no pleasure whatsoever to make this video but I'm very saddened because it's a classical case of I told you so. When I did my research based year as a medical student I predicted that this would happen and no one listened and very sadly it's taken the death of a student to make me say I was right all along um, and I'm going to detail how this could have been prevented and what should have been done. I'll also detail what would have happened, uh, what was going through that student's mind because I'm speaking here from experience. Right, first things first, um, let me detail how it could have been prevented. My uncle is a professor of history at the University of Princeton. In America, it is standard practice for university students to get their marked up examination papers given back to them once they've been marked. Now, he told me of one case study where a student uh, had to do five exams in an, a, um, in an exam. So five essays in an exam. The student got 18 out of 20, 15, 18, 17, and I think um, 16, I think it was. Um, but what actually happened was the student then got a letter in the post saying you've got 32%, you failed, and you've got to do resits in summer. But clipped to that letter were the marked up examination scripts. So the student just made a, a made an appointment with my uncle. It was resolved in a you know with a min minimum of fuss. Under our system, <clears throat> this is what would happen. The, uh, at some universities, they put the student's examination results up on a notice board. So if you failed, everyone can see. Then if you failed, you might have to appeal. You might have to face a review panel, and basically you're, you're absolutely stuffed. You know because. At best, that, appeal, uh, that review panel are going to allow you another attempt, or in my case, overturn the exam result. But it's very stressful. Now, that would have been the simple solution. Uh, to, and, you know, if this would have happened, then this case would not have occurred. Now, when I was a medical student, I, the, I submitted a, a paper to the student British Medical Journal on why I thought students should have their papers back once marked. And they actually said, great, and they wanted me to amend it a little bit. And then what actually happened was, to make matters more controversial, they actually asked the Dean of my medical school, Professor A.P. Wheatman, to write an article why students should not have their papers back once marked. On finding out I was writing the proposing article, he demanded to see my article before he wrote his. And I know why. He was afraid I was going to tell the general public about how Dr. Steve Peters, the undergraduate course tutor in the Department of Psychiatry and various others in the Department of Psychiatry, had falsified my examination results to such an extent that one examination was, uh, was overturned from fail to pass using information that students don't normally get hold of. That's a different story altogether. That's why, and if, uh, for those of you who uh, support Liverpool FC like I do, you'll know that Steve Peters is the same guy who's treated Stephen Gerrard, the Liverpool captain. But that's a different story altogether. <clears throat> so, let me tell you the benefits of returning examination papers back to candidates once the marks, and I'll also detail how this case could have been prevented okay and what was going through the student's mind first of all it, most importantly by returning the examination paper back you would give a, you give a feedback a student cannot be expected to change or improve if they don't know where they've gone wrong in the past and simply receiving a grade is not sufficient for this purpose it is fundamental to the learning process that a student can actually take the examination paper home go through go through it read constructive comments of feedback and learn that is a, uh, simply receiving a, uh, receiving a grade is not sufficient for this purpose. Secondly, it prevents the, it protects the examining body against allegations of bias or prejudice. When I was a medical student, um, I had this lecturer, Steve Peters, who was trying to get me kicked off my course. And I took the view that if I was going to go down, I'm going to take them with me. So I initiated the Commission for Racial Equality Investigation into the University of Sheffield. What I did was I... Um, 
I went to see my local MP, Richard Allen, about the anonymous marking system. He wrote a letter to the undergraduate dean, Mr Page. Mr Page wrote a very stupid letter back. I got both letters, gave them to the student union newspaper. Great. I then got a list of those who, the official list of those <coughs> who took the exams and the official loads of those who took failed them. Guess what I did then? I gave them all to the Commission for Racial Equality. And that almost brought the university down to its knees. But I took the view that if I'm going to go down, I'm going to take them with me, which uh, I almost did. Right, uh, next thing is, if there's been a mistake, it's a lot easier to uh, sort out. There have been various scandals in recent years about A-level exam papers getting mixed up or students giving the wrong results. This is easily resolved, like in this case. Letter in the post, here's your result, here's your marks of exam paper and the marking scheme. If there's been a mistake, the first person who will notice is the student. Very easily resolved. It greatly simplifies any appeals process. And I can speak from that from my own experience. If you have failed, it's a lot easier to accept. And it also protects the student against harassment. When I was a medical student at Sheffield University, there were some, several students who actually were, <clears throat> were threatened with um, examination failure unless they had sex with some of the consultants. And the students had no choice but to comply with it. And um, they couldn't say anything for fear of repercussions. Um, because obviously, if you don't sleep with a consultant, you can get failed. If you complain, they can have you failed. It's very difficult to do anything about. In medicine, there are face-to-face -face examinations with clinical exams and vivids with face-to-face. -face, but with today's technology, you can record them. I actually recorded a viva, and on several occasions, I recorded a vivas without the examiners knowing, and uh, they got very embarrassed when they when they realised I'd record them without them without their knowing. They actually falsified a few reports, but that's a different story altogether. <clears throat> it also protects the student against uh, against harassment. For example, um, some students are afraid to fill out surveys or complain about mistreatment for fear of academic repercussions. Well, this actually protects them. OK, now the other benefit is that it helps perfect, uh, it helps the, avoid the expense of an anonymous marking system. Now, you, for those lay people among you, you're wondering what is anonymous marking? Anonymous marking is a system where um, instead of the, the, the examiner does not see the students names. And in fact, this sees an, uh, a theoretically a candidate number. Now, statistically speaking, according to the National Union Students Mark My Words campaign, a non-white student will get, let, on average, 20% lower marks than a white student. OK, <clears throat> so th that's why this, they push for uh, anonymous marking. There are inherent flaws with anonymous marking. Firstly, <clears throat> it's, e very, well, it's very easy to flout. Dr. Steve Peters, the guy who caused all my problems at Sheffield University, would openly admit that he had the list of names and numbers before the papers were marked, well, before the examination paper was sat, and would insist you put your names on your papers. And he intimidated students into that. He got into a bit of trouble for that. Students have been known not to put their correct examination numbers on their papers. Um, Professor Weekman admitted to me that students have been allowed to put bank account numbers, switch card numbers, visa numbers, telephone numbers, mobile phone numbers, telephone, um, what do you call it, T TV serial numbers. One put his wife's, uh, girlfriend's uh, vital statistics. He actually said, you will not believe what we get. It's actually quite true. Students don't, put, don't always put the correct numbers. Most students don't forget their names. On, um, let me just demonstrate this. On some examination papers, there's a confidentiality flap. So basically, you put your anonymous number there, you put your name here, and, uh, and fold it over. When I was a student, it was almost impossible to seal down. To, well, it was, it was next to useless. So we actually sellotape them down. Um, some students can, I must digress here. I remember one of my housemates, uh, she went for an exam, and uh, I noticed she left her union card. And what happened was, uh, I cycled down to university, went to the examination room, went in and vigilated and said, this student is sitting over there, she left her a union card number at home. And, um, you know, that just shows the stupidity of it, because that's what what, what happened. The students actually left, uh, her, you know, might forget their number. What they can sometimes do, and I saw this when I did paediatrics, what they can do is they get the marked up exam script and they get someone gets a post-it note, get, puts a student student's number in, puts a name on, and puts it on the, on the top cover of the paper, 
And then once the paper's marked, take it off. No, one, no one's any the wiser. That's a way around it. Sometimes what they also do is they put the papers in numerical order of student number. And from that, it is very, very easy to work out whose paper is whose. It's very, very easy to do. Um, also, they do what's known as seat numbers. So again, you can actually uh, work these out. So basically, it's it's an absolutely silly system, anonymous marking. It's very expensive. It's a lot easier to just basically put the name on the, uh, the your name on your paper, and basically return the paper back to the student. Dead easy. Now, <clears throat> what should have happened? Should have happened. I understand this student had resets. No student should fail an exam. What should happen is they should do frequent formative assessment uh, every week or every fortnight. Formative assessment is assessment that doesn't count towards anything, but it gives you a guide on how well or how badly you're doing. What actually happens is, as a result of formative assessment, they can predict before the, before the exam who's going to pass and who's going to fail. It's actually a very, very effective mechanism. I'm amazed they don't do it. On top of that, there should be more coursework. Ideally, what I'd like to see is they should, the, uh, any university course should have coursework and what actually happened, a majority of it should be coursework and the student should be able to pass the, the assessment without uh, on the basis of the coursework and the examination should just be icing on the cake. That's what I think should happen. On top of that, the marked up examination work and the coursework should be given back to the student once marked. Now, what would have been going through the student's mind? This is something I predicted in 1999. Stu well, in 1999, I predicted that undergraduate students uh, who had no parental funding by 2010 would graduate with debts of over £35,000 at least. This will lead to students not buying houses, leading to a recession in the housing industry, causing uh, a recession in the rest of the economy, causing massive unemployment. Sound familiar? Yep, I predicted that, but I was, uh, I was told I was a loony. What then happened was, imagine this student, she's done her second year, she's done her research. She's got debts of about £25,000. Guess what? Told she can't progress to the third year of course because she's failed them. She's got no means of paying them off. What, what is the major cause of suicide among uh, people in their eight, between 18 and 30? Financial pressures. See what went through her mind. Okay. Now, there's not much we can do in the short, in the short term about finance, but I'm working on that. Uh, I actually get people on multiple streams of income, and I am working on a program for students as we speak. But in the short term, if you look below, you'll see a link to a governmental petition that I've made. Now, the, on the, uh, I'm asking the government to legislate that examination papers should be returned back to students once marked, and they should um, at, at all levels. Now, what should also happen is um, once you get five signatures, we get it approved. If we get 21, that's the maximum it can take before approval. Then what actually happens is, <laughs> so I'm coughing a bit. Um, once you if get approved, we get, if we, if once approved, we get 10,000 signatures. They get a, um, what do you call it? Um, a response from the government. Get 100,000, then they consider for debate in parliament. So please, Sign it below and let's prevent another tragedy like Marid Falls. Thank you very much for your time. I'll speak to you soon. But as I said, it gives me no pleasure to say uh, I told you so. If you've seen this video on, on YouTube, please like, comment and subscribe. If you're seeing this video on Facebook, like, comment and subscribe. Look forward to seeing you soon. Bye bye.